It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. This week on The Murder Diaries, we're speaking with Julie Murray, a fierce advocate not only for her missing sister, Maura Murray, but for other missing people as well. We discuss Maura's disappearance, dispel misinformation about the case, and learn what life has been like for Julie these last 19 years as the sister of a missing person. Julie brings such a unique perspective to the true crime genre, and we're so grateful to be able to share this conversation with all of you. Now here it is. So thank you so much for being here today, Julie. It's honestly an honor. We have been watching your TikToks for quite a while now. So we're so honored to have you on the podcast. Well, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for giving me this space to talk about my missing sister. I always jump at the opportunity when I get reputable, ethical creators such as yourself. So thank you for your approach. Oh, that means a lot, of course. Yeah, that's so sweet. Seriously, thank you so much for those kind words. Now, Maura's case, it's not one that not a lot of people know about in the true crime space. It's gotten a lot of coverage since she went missing in February of 2004. But what we don't always get to hear about is who Maura was. Can you tell us a little bit about your sister, who she was, what she was like, what your favorite memory is with her? I love this question because what's lost in a lot of the coverage of my sister's case, like you alluded to, it's it's so heavily covered that the human in Mars humanity is often stripped away in going over the timeline, going over the theories, going over the rabbit holes. And so I always love to get back to the real human at the heart of the case. And that's my little sister, Mara. She was two and a half years younger than I am. And she went missing when she was just 21 years old. I was 24 at the time. And, you know, I like to describe Mara as just super talented in so many different ways. Athletically, she was a powerhouse in anything that she did, whether it be running, basketball, I mean, soccer, softball, any sport, she just picked right up. My brother, Freddie, he was, he's a bit older, well, a lot older, and he picked up mountain biking. And Mara had no experience with mountain biking, you know, on trails with roots and rocks and dirt, but she just jumped right on and kept up with them. And so it's things like that, that really kind of captures how talented she was. So she had that going for her. And she also was so smart. I'm talking about, you know, almost perfect SAT scores. So she scored a 1420 on her SATs, which is astonishing. And so she had those two things going for her. But Mara was not the one to ever brag about how talented she was. She would she couldn't take a compliment. She'd blush, you know, super introverted. Everybody in my family is introverted to include myself. So it's ironic. I'm always out here on these podcasts, but it's just one of those things that, you know, if you're in my position, you have to just suck it up and do it because, you know, if I don't do it, then who else is? And she's missing and she's voiceless. And so I owe it to her to talk about who she actually was because, you know, like I said at the beginning, she's her humanity's kind of been stripped away and, and people forget about we're talking about a young woman with her whole life ahead of her was very, very talented. Yeah. So she was humble. She was studying to be a nurse. One of the the cutest things she always did was write thank you letters. And she would write a thank you letter to anyone that showed her any level of kindness. I'm talking about the handwritten letters, snail mail. You know, this was back in 2004 or pre-2004. So we didn't have uh, text and social media and things like that. And, you know, we had email, but she prefers to write 
handwritten notes. So that's just a little snapshot of who she was. But to get to your second part of that question, my favorite memories with Mara were definitely on our summer vacations, hiking and camping in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. That is what we loved to do. We felt most at home there. My whole family, we love the outdoors. Being out in nature is, is was our happy place. And so I have very fond memories of doing all those things with her. One of the things I miss most about Mara is how funny she was and witty. It was kind of like, sort of like a deadpan type of humor where she should just say things that you had to think about. And then you're like, oh, that's really funny. <laughs> um, so I, I miss that. And, you know, growing up in New England, there's a lot of competitiveness, especially with the large family. You know, we had five kids. So we didn't have a lot of money. So we just talk smack back and forth constantly. And I miss that. I really do. You posted a TikTok recently where you talked about how you really, really wanted a dog while you were in college or while you were in the army or something like that. And I love this story. Um, I'm not going to retell it for you, but just to get to the point, you weren't able to get one, but your mom and Mara really wanted you to have one. So they bought you this Dalmatian statue. And I can't remember what the name was, but I love hearing stories like that about your sister and about your guys' relationship because it just shows that not only was she funny, she was caring and really creative. She thought out of the box, my sister wants a dog. Well, I'll get her a dog. And so she did. I don't know. It was really great to hear that story about your sister. Yeah. And that's the first time I shared that. You know, I've had that dog since before Mara went missing and it's gone everywhere with me. <laughs> and through my my moves and traveling, it's uh it's down a leg. So, um, but it's one of the, one of the things I'll treasure forever because it was just so typical Mara. You know, she got me this ceramic dog and, you know, when I got it, I was just shaking my head and then obviously started to laugh, but <laughs> she actually named it Spike and Spike has been with me for 20 years now. We might need a picture of Spike to share with listeners. I love <laughs> that so much. Yeah. You recently did a multi-part series on TikTok about some misinformation going on in Morris' case. And one piece of misinformation that was mentioned in that series and that really kind of stuck out to us and really sh struck us was this piece of misinformation is out there. My family is complicit in Morris' disappearance. We really had no words, and you could even hear it when I'm trying to like word the way to even ask this. Like, is there seriously a court of public opinion that erroneously believes that you and your family are are complicit in this? It's unreal. Unfortunately, yes. And the most disappointing part of that is that type of nonsense is amplified by people with a platform purporting to be professional. And so then the misinformation train is running wild, uh, you know, and there's no way to stop it. So once you kind of put that seed in people's minds, they just run with it. And it's not based in any evidence. It's not based on any fact. I mean, if you look at the lengths that my family has gone through to try to continue to raise awareness now 19 and a half years down the road to suggest that we helped her disappear. We know where she is. We don't want to find her. The things that people will say are just sickening, for lack of a better word. Yeah, but it's true. I mean, there's a school of thought that my family is suspicious, you know, and then if you look at what we have done, that doesn't make sense, right? So my dad was screaming for the FBI early, early on. And so what what family screams for the FBI if we're, we're actually hiding Mara? And the emotional and psychological turmoil that a family like mine goes through, it's hard to put into words. And to suggest that we did this and we know the answers is, is it's kind of laughable, you know? It is. It's really sick. And it doesn't make any sense either. Like you're saying, your family specifically you and your dad have been on the circuit for 19 and a half years. It's not like you're getting paid for your time and energy and emotional toll that this all of it takes. 
why would you put yourself through this if you were trying to cover your tracks? It makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, that and the fact that I'm very much introverted. I'm not comfortable putting myself out there. I'm not comfortable being as vulnerable. I've gotten better at being vulnerable because I think there's value in that. But this isn't something that I choose to do. I'm not doing this for my own benefit. For people to think that, it it makes me question them and their motives and you know what narrative they're trying to push. It also brings into question a lot of the discussion that's been started within the last couple of years of true crime ethics. Like, mm-hmm. are we really victim blaming here? And are you know what I mean? Like, why are we pointing the finger at a family that's, that's just trying to get help? And I feel like this conversation about true crime ethics has been brought up about if you're going to be talking about true crime, try and do something with a good reason of why. Why are you doing this? Why would someone spread this misinformation? What is their intention behind it? It, It's insidious. Right. I love that the way that you worded that because it's right. It's You have to look at the intention behind these type of behaviors and that's going to get you to potentially the reasoning behind it. And I think that's definitely the case in that piece of misinformation that's been swirling around online. And the other thing about it is, you know, once you put an idea out on the internet, you can never take it away. It is there forever. And the people, the real people at the center of the tragedy that have to wake up with it every single day, they, they're they thinking about those type of things. We're seeing what you're saying about us. And it's very hurtful. And it's it causes so much pain. And it's just nonsensical. It's almost like this idea that Because a case is out there in the media, especially one like Mora's, that a lot of people could reference and say, this is what happened. This is when it happened because of the amount of coverage. There's almost like this entitlement to their opinions on it and about you and your family as if it's like like a movie, like it's not real. When in reality, this is you and your family's life every single day since February 2004. Awful. Right. Yeah. I mean, Mar has been used and and treated with that sense of entitlement, like she's a piece of public property. And mm. the problem with Mara's case is that there are so few answers that you can literally fill in the gaps with mm. anything that you want yeah. and build this narrative at the expense of the real humans, you know, just trying to stay afloat every single day and get through and you know, we have to remember, Mar is still missing, mm-hmm. right? So there's still investigatory efforts that are happening, even now, 19 years later. So my family is obviously heavily involved in still trying to find her. And then having this additional burden of trying to battle people online to defend ourselves against negatives, it's very challenging and it's unfair. It's almost like you're screaming into the void because there are so many other voices spreading and retelling these lies that have been put out there. Well, that's that, that's what it feels like <laughs> a lot of times. It, it feels like... And you know, what's interesting is sometimes when I expose some evidence or uh, things that contradict n- narratives that aren't based in fact, people ignore it. They ignore the facts because guess what? It's a better story if it's mm. more salacious. It's more sensationalized. So we don't want to go into the boring details of why that couldn't possibly happen. You know, people want to be entertained on the backs of a family suffering such a a tragedy and having to live it for 19 years. And we see that with a lot of other cases, not to derail completely away from your sister, but recently Ryan Murphy's show on Jeffrey Dahmer was back in the news because he received 13 Emmy nominations for the show. That's much to the chagrin of the families who actually are, you know, related to the victims. They are protesting that this man even decided to make this fictionalized version of what happened to their loved ones. And people are still rewarding him for his efforts in making this horrific piece of art. And that's in quotes. And people can't see me doing the air quotes, but you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. I I mean, it is definitely re-traumatizing. And I can't imagine what those families are going through when they weren't even given the basic courtesy of a heads up. To have to sit down and and see that it's got millions and millions of views and it's the worst day of your life. 
without even a heads up. It's disgusting. Paige mentioned your TikTok series about misinformation, and there were other parts in addition to the one we covered. Do you mind going over the other pieces of misinformation out there so we can clear it up once and for all? Yeah, I mean, there's so much misinformation, I couldn't possibly go through it all. But some of the things that I see repeated over and over and over again are the fact that um, Mara hit a tree or the accident was staged or all of these theories. But people fail to realize that my family had the vehicle analyzed. So every vehicle has the equivalent of an aircraft black box and Mars Saturn that was found up in New Hampshire had a, it's called a SDM, a sensing diagnostic module. And it basically tells you what happened leading up to the accident. So we have that and we know that there was two impacts that had uh, caused airbag deployment and they happened two one hundredths of a second apart from each other. So it wasn't like two separate accidents. So what I believe is the car probably went off the road and that was the first alert that hit the black box. And then the second was the full deployment of the airbags. So we think maybe she went down into the ditch and then came up a little bit and hit the snowbank. But the police report indicates that she hit a tree. But according to the vehicle forensic report, the damage is not consistent with that of hitting a tree. So you can choose to ignore that or not. It's not a huge deal, but it is something that's been floating around there. One of the more harmful pieces of misinformation that I talk about is this idea that Mara was involved in a felony hit and run before she disappeared. And that was the catalyst for why she disappeared. Now, that hit and run was investigated and there's absolutely zero evidence to indicate that Mara was involved with this hit and run at all. And the young man that was hit was in a coma. And, you know, I empathize with his family. However, there's nothing to to connect Mara to it other than it was in the same location um, at UMass. So to suggest that Mara is this criminal on the run, Mm -hmm. it's just not ethical. It's not helpful. And it's just more nonsense, but people continue to theorize and say that, yeah, Mars uh, did that. Another piece of misinformation is that Mara was kicked out of West Point. Now, Mara did get in trouble at West Point. She stole $5 worth of makeup and she had to go through this honor board process, which is a West Point cadet run trial for lack of a better word. And she was going through that process and it hadn't um, concluded before she decided to leave West Point and go to UMass. And, you know, I, I went to West Point as well. So I know the system and I know that some of my friends did far worse and mm-hmm. were either turned back a year, meaning they had to repeat a whole year or they had to go into the regular army and serve as a lower enlisted soldier for six months to a year. But it's rare for people to get kicked out. It's just painting this picture of Mara that's not true. And what that does is it allows people to rationalize their exploitation. So if you paint this this victim of this tragedy or this missing person as somewhat less than, then they're undeserving of resources, you know, and we see it all the time with victim blaming. Oh, she was, she was asking for it. She wore, you know, her skirt was too high or short or whatever, you know, we see this all the time. And then that opens the floodgates for people to victim blame. So that's just another thing that's, it's just harmful to the investigation. And it does nothing to further the case. These type of pieces of misinformation are just for content right? Because it's a, it makes it a better story. We mm-hmm. Listen, we don't need a better story. We have a mystery on our hands. You know, Mara disappeared, vanished off the face of the earth. That's, that's enough. We don't need to add on layers and layers of sensationalism to make it a better story. It's impossible for a family like mine to dispel all the misinformation that there is on the internet. So if I were to to try to do that and correct the the internet, like I said before, even when I give the actual facts, people ignore them. And so I have to choose what I'm going to spend my time on. Am I going to spend 24-7 correcting everybody online and 
Or am I going to look for my missing sister and work with PIs and investigators to actually make some progress in finding her? Because that's what's most important for my family. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's it is difficult. It would be like a a full-time job, maybe for like more than one person, probably, to do that when it comes to Maura's case, at least. Yeah. And the other thing that exacerbates the problem is we are all looking at every decision that Mara made as a 21-year-old, you know, still developing young woman and dissecting every single decision under a microscope. You know, I, like you said, I would hate for someone to look at the decisions I made when I was 21. Mm -hmm. And then you can take those decisions and in isolation, create a narrative about what that means about her. And that's kind of how these these theories and these rabbit holes develop is you're just looking at these small decisions in isolation instead of the totality of the human, the multidimensional human that was young and still developing and made mistakes. I'm not condoning any of her poor decisions by any means. Is stealing bad? Of course. Is lying bad? Absolutely. Have I lied before? Yeah, I think we all have. Have we made dumb decisions? Yeah, especially when we're in our young 20s. So I think people lose sight of that sometimes and they just look at individual decisions that Mara made that, you know, don't paint the full picture. And now a word from today's sponsor. I've been sleeping on Blissey pillowcases for a couple of years. I literally have 10 of them. And let me tell you, the sleep has been nothing short of blissful. That's because Blissey uses award-winning 100% mulberry silk, which is what's best for your hair and skin. It reduces frizz, tangles, and prevents breakage. It keeps the moisture in your hair and keeps your skincare products and natural moisture on your skin, while cotton literally absorbs it off your face. With Blissey Silk Pillowcases, you can say goodbye to wrinkles, dry, flaky, and red skin in the morning, and wake up with healthier, shinier hair that won't take an hour to fix. Like Natalie said, Blissey Pillowcases are made with 100% mulberry silk, which just so happens to be naturally hypoallergenic, so you can sleep more comfortably without itching or rashes. And unlike other silk pillowcases, these are some of the highest quality silk and are machine washable and durable. Not to mention, it's the perfect gift for any occasion. I've given them to my mom, my sister. I make my husband sleep on one. Everyone I love loves Blissey just as much as I do. Plus, the pillowcases come in gift-ready packaging that they'll be sure to love. Besides all the amazing benefits for skin and hair, one of the things I've enjoyed most about using Blissey is that they regulate temperature, keeping you cool at night. Seriously, the entire pillow, cool to the touch. No more sweaty nights spent tossing and turning around for me. And they're really soft too. Everybody loves Blissey and you will too. They have a ton of different prints and colors. And like we said, Blissey makes for a great gift because there's an option for literally everyone. And men love them too. They have over 1 million raving fans and you will be next. Try Blissey now risk-free for 60 nights at blissey.com slash diaries and get an additional 30% off. That's B-L-I-S-S-Y dot com slash diaries and use code diaries to get an additional 30% off. Your skin and hair and everyone you gift it to will thank you. I can tell you feel very protective of her. She is your little sister. I have a little sister little. I mean, she's two years younger than me. So same age. Like we're all two years apart from our sisters. It's tough when people say things about your sister and your little bit of a mama bear comes out, even though you're her sibling, but you want to protect her. And especially with your sister not being there to, like you said at the beginning, she's voiceless. You're her only voice, you and your dad. And I can't imagine how it must feel to be, it must be frustrating like to go to bed every night to hear people saying, these lies. Yeah, it's 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 infuriating. Um, but again, you have to decide what's worth your time and energy. I mean, I could, you know, make myself so angry to to the point where I'm paralyzed, you know, and I can't make any further progress on what is happening in the investigation or people or emails I need to respond to or people I need to talk to. And that's a disservice to Mara because she's still missing. She deserves to be found. So I Again, a lot of times in these cold cases, it's the family that um, that burden falls on. So I owe it to Mara not to get distracted, right? And, you know, 
everyone in my family has been drug through the dirt, myself included. I mean, I could go on the internet right now and Google myself or go on Reddit and see what a horrible person I am or how suspicious I am or what a liar I am. But what that doesn't help me. You know, that's not my goal. I, I My reputation online or on Reddit, that means nothing to me. I want to find my sister. And so the rest of my family, you know, there's been crazy insinuations against um, my family, my dad especially. But we, we've always had Mara as our North Star. And so we ignore the trolls, ignore the distractions, because it's not what's best in a missing person case. How do you compartmentalize that, though, and focus on that North Star that, you know, the memory and Mora, you know, in the metaphorical spirit here, if I may use that terminology, how do you focus on that when you see these, like, you know, a rotten article and the misinformation and things that are being said that are awful about you or your family? How do you compartmentalize that? Well, it's easy for me because I know that if I were missing, Mara would be doing the same exact thing. And she needs me to stay focused. She needs, she needs my family not to get distracted. And so that makes it easy. Does it hurt? Yeah, of course it hurts. Of course it hurts. Like I said, I'm an introvert and and I'm reading all this stuff about myself online. It's just, it boggles my mind sometimes too. I'm like, why do these people even care what, what I'm doing or, you know, it, let's find Mara. Why couldn't we work together and and solve this mystery instead of wasting time talking about how my family is suspicious? I mean, it's ridiculous. That's so true, though. With all the energy and time they're spending repeating these things, imagine all of that effort being put towards spreading Mara's story, spreading her name, her image, her likeness. You know what I mean? So many more people would hear about her. And maybe that many more people would have their eyes open or... Because someone has to know something. Someone knows something. Someone either saw something, has heard something, and it's so much a disservice, all of this noise Mm -hmm. that's going on. It's noise. Yeah, that's what it is. It's just noise. It's not furthering the case in any way. We could go on and on about the misinformation because, yeah, we're definitely getting heated with you and can't imagine you yourself, how it could feel. There's no way. But I think one of the things that we would like to kind of clear up is there's not a lot of evidence as to where Mora was headed when she was driving on Route 112, besides a map quest that had Berkshire and Vermont. It, where do you and your family hold or believe today that she was going that night? Of course, you have a, a lot of history out in the mountains that way, but where do you guys view that she was going? Well, the short answer is we still don't know what her destination was. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is we do know that she looked up directions to Burlington, Vermont, and she called a condo owner in Bartlett, New Hampshire. So Bartlett is a place where my family vacationed multiple times a year. It was our home away from home. We felt at peace there. Like I said in the beginning, it was our, our, our happy place. But here's the thing. Burlington and Bartlett are very two separate geographical locations. They're separated by two hours. So the day that she went missing, she's looking up two very different locations. It's not like she was looking up Bartlett, New Hampshire and say North Conway, New Hampshire, which are pretty close, maybe 20 or 30 minutes drive. We're talking about a two hour drive. So it's unclear what the final destination was. I believe that she was unclear on what her final destination was. I don't think she had the plan fully developed because she didn't book any reservations. She didn't have a whole lot of resources. She only had $280 that she took out from the ATM earlier in the day that she disappeared. What I do know is that her plan did not include Woodsville, New Hampshire, because Woodsville, New Hampshire is not a destination. It's a small rural town. There's no attractions there. It's just a place en route to the White Mountains. And she was coming from UMass, so she would have had to travel through Woodsville, New Hampshire. So I am confident that Woodsville, New Hampshire was where she ended up, was not her destination. Mm -hmm. And my family had never spent any time in Woodsville. There's really nothing there. There's no mountains to climb. 
time. There's no, like I said, no attractions, no camping areas, nothing. Um, so I think maybe we we had drove through it before, but there would be no reason for us to go there, if that makes sense. I think that what information's out there about the case in terms of Maura being on Route 112 and there being an accident and her car being found on the side of the road lends to why that belief would make sense. Not that you need my approval at all, but it it makes sense to me. I, as somebody, you know, that would be learning about the case, trying to get awareness out there about it, it doesn't feel like that to me either. It just seems like she's passing through. Something happened with the car and it was on the side of the road. So that, that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. I want to talk about your time on the Unfound podcast. You talked about the gap between true crime content creators their consumers, and the real humans at the center of the stories. You had this really beautiful quote where you said that empathy is the bridge to heal the gap. How do we get there? What, what's the best way for creators to express that empathy in a way that those in the center can feel supported by it? Yeah, what I see is that there is an empathy crisis, not only in society, but specifically in true crime. You know, and I see it in my experience, my lived experience in true crime, because that's my everyday life, right? So Mara went missing in 2004, the same week Facebook launched. And so I've seen the evolution of true crime from when there was no social media, no Facebook, no Twitter, no TikTok, none of that. You know, she just got her first cell phone. So there is texting, but you had to type the number like three times to get the letter that you wanted, you know. Um, there is no smartphones and things like that. And there definitely wasn't any podcasts. It's not like it is today. And I think sometimes people lose sight of that. You know, we're talking about MapQuest, where you had to get a printer and print out the directions. You couldn't just go on a Google Maps and, and find out where you're going. You know, I wish Mar did have a smartphone because, you know, would be probably wouldn't be in this situation if she did. Um, So I've seen the evolution of all of that. And I've seen how social media and podcasting has evolved. And there was a period where it was ugly. There was a period where I felt like people were just peering into our lives and Mara's lives and looking at us as if we were characters for entertainment. Now, in recent years, there's been a switch. It's it's gotten better where people are realizing that these are real stories, real humans, real emotions. And the words that you say, whether it be on Twitter or on a podcast, affect the real humans that are left behind in the wakes of these tragedies. And I realized that there was something missing. And what was missing was this scarce resource that is called empathy. And so I've been advocating for an infusion of empathy into the true crime space because I've felt the power of it, number one. I've I've felt what it can do, how transformative it can be when you have a better understanding of the real humans and the victim. And I've also felt the pain of its absence. So I've felt, I've lived through those dark times and this evolution of the true crime genre. And what empathy does, it's, you know, it's it's a superpower. It allows creators and consumers to connect with the real humans at the center of the tragedies. That is so very important because a lot of these family members and survivors and victims feel alone and they isolate and they're afraid to talk about their experiences. They might be afraid of backlash or somebody twisting their words or being exploited. And so they kind of turtle up and just go through that grieving process on their own. And I was, I, I've been there and I know what that feels like. And it was only when I started to connect with people that I felt safer coming out and talking about my sister and talking about her humanity and who she was as a human and being more vulnerable myself. Although I'll still get criticized for whatever, <laughs> whatever you can criticize me for, it's it's already been done. So good luck with that. But to answer your question, I think empathy is the key to bridge that gap. And it's so important. And uh, especially in the true crime space where you have these vulnerable people and, and victims and families that 
They want to be heard. They want compassion. We're not asking for you to fix our problem. We're asking for you to listen. And that is so powerful. And so I developed the Engage with Empathy campaign to try to bring some awareness to this this superpower that I discovered in my 19 years of dealing with, you know, my own true crime experience. And the Engage with Empathy campaign is built on the CARE principle. And the CARE is the acronym. So C is Center the Victim. A is a, avoid harmful speculation, research responsibly, and then engage with empathy. So it's a quick and easy way to kind of have a roadmap for how you should be navigating if you are a creator and if you're a consumer. That's incredible. And that's not all you've been up to either. I mean, they had the inaugural Mara Murray Scholarship that was awarded this year, I think at the end of May, early June. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Because you guys have definitely been busy. Oh yeah, and we've got we got some stuff coming up that has been keeping me busy too. But yeah, this past fall, um I had some help from some other advocates and we launched or developed the first annual Mara Murray Scholarship Award and it was a way to empower another young student athlete that had that same fighting competitive spirit that Mara had. And it was a positive way to honor her. And so we handed it out, my dad and I, at the our high school that Mara and I both graduated from this past spring. You know, it was great. It, we got so much support and we're going to continue to have that every year. And, you know, we need more positive things like that, especially in Mara's case, because it is so sad and it's been so long. So any opportunity that I get to bring some positive energy into Mara's case, I will I jump at it. You and your family have spearheaded the search for Mora over the last 19 years, and it is so very clear that you're not going to be stopping until you get the answers that you all and Mora deserve. Do you have advice for those who are going through the same thing, who it might just be happening to now? Because it happens every single day that somebody, people go missing. Yes. And I have received emails and calls and messages from other people going through similar circumstances. You know, every case is different, obviously. But the first thing I tell people that reach out to me is you're not alone. And that's that immediately connects uh, with the other person and the other family is struggling with this because think about it. There's no preparation you can do for this type of thing. There's no guidebook you receive when your sibling goes missing. There's, you don't know what you're doing. You're just doing the best you can. You're just focusing on the next thing and trying to keep yourself from spiraling. And it's easy to do because as the days tick by and then the years, you know, and then the decades, you start to lose hope. And that is a danger zone for families because you always want to hold out hope that maybe you're not going to, you know, find find the body or maybe you're not going to find out who did it. But the hope for my family is maybe we're going to find an answer. You know, there's no such thing as closure for something like this. Closure is for real estate. It's not for tragedies resolution is our hope and to get some answers. So I tell people you're not alone and that that's been helpful. People have connected with me, like I said, and listened and made me feel less isolated. And that was super helpful. And they did through understanding and listening and compassion and empathy. And that's why I go back to how powerful that is. It's it's going to help these humans get through this very, very difficult time. Another thing that I tell people is to ask for help. You're not the only one that has had to navigate whatever circumstances you're going through. So don't be afraid to ask for help. And also, don't be afraid to say no. Before we went on, I talked about how at first I would say yes to everything. Yes to any sort of attention that I could get on Namara, but I realized not all of the attention was good and not all of the attention was in Mara's best interest. So 
you can protect your energy and you can say no to things that make you feel uncomfortable and you can say no to preserve your own mental health because the families are the ones that have to carry the burden, like I said before. And if you're not healthy enough to do it or in the right place to do it, you're not going to be as effective. Honestly, a couple of quotes from today that are really sitting with me is like the the empathy crisis and pretty much everything that you were just talking about. It's it's amazing. I think another kind of spot to close up this interview and episode, is there any up-to-date information or anything regarding what your family has going on or Morris case that you would like to let our listeners know? That you're able to share, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, specific to Mara's case, we always have something going on. And it's crazy to think of that 19 years later, we still have a list of people to talk to, places to look at, things to search. For instance, tomorrow, Saturday, we have a private search, you know, at an area of interest. For me, that that helps me stay focused. Like I said, I've been harping on staying focused on the investigation. So um, we're constantly doing things. And one of the things that I, I'm doing, and as you guys know, is I'm going to continue to talk about Mara until I don't have a voice any longer, you know, because that is what is going to solve this case is that awareness, reaching that one or two people that may know something. Because I've said it so many times, I believe Mara's case is solvable. And the other major thing that we have going on, and it goes back to empathy. You know, I've connected with other families of missing and murdered, specifically in the state of New Hampshire. And I've shared frustrations. I've shared laughs. We've cried. All of it. The whole roller coaster of emotions with these other families. And it's just a silent connection where you don't even have to say words. You just get it. And that's because there's that understanding and we can empathize with each other. And it, it's, you know, collectively we're more powerful. So we are organizing a major advocacy effort in New Hampshire in August. And I can't wait to share details about it. Um, it should be within the next week or two when I, you know, can share those details. But that's something people can get on board with and there'll be calls to action. And, you know, that's the other thing, you know, when when you're consuming true crime, you want to look for what can I do? Like, what sort of advocacy avenues do I have? Am I just listening to this podcast to entertain myself on the drive to work or while I'm cleaning my house? Or is there a call to action? You know, my friend Sarah Turney, her podcast is amazing because after every episode, there is that specific call to action. Here's what you can do. And it's not any major muscle movement. It could be as simple as sharing a missing person's flyer, you know, a click of a button, using social media for the good that it can do, especially for these cases. So when you're consuming true crime, always keep an ear out for, are these creators offering any sort of advocacy or help? What do these families need? That's a good guide to, to figure out whether, you know, it's part of the solution or part of the problem. So that was a long-winded way to say, yeah, we got a ton going on and um, I'm going to share it when I can. We'll definitely be staying tuned for those updates on your TikTok and social media platforms. Can you let our listeners know where they can find you, where they should be looking for those updates? Yeah, I'm on TikTok and my handle is at Mara Murray Missing. And I got to tell you the story about TikTok. So what I love about TikTok, I, I don't like... I, I hated it at first because you have to be vulnerable and you got to be on camera and all this stuff. But what I've found is that being able to connect with people and having people see me and look into my eyes has done wonders for making that empathy bridge and that gap between consuming and the real humans closer. And so people are realizing, well, wait a minute, I read that she's a liar and suspicious. But then you see my face on your TikTok and you're like, eh, she seems just like a regular person trying to find her sister to me. So, you know, TikTok's kind of gimmicky. It can be, but it, it has allowed me to reach a new 
whole new audience and it's allowed people to be able to empathize with me and connect with me. So at Mara Murray Missing on TikTok, I'm on Twitter at Julie Murray 2 underscore 9. And I'm on Facebook. I run a private Facebook group dedicated to Mara and that's Mara Murray Official Group. I think that's the the name of it. It's a long name and you have to request access. Um, so that's the family one. And then the website, I keep updated with all the different podcasts and interviews and news and all of that. And that's maramurraymissing.org. We'll include all the links for you in our show notes. Yes. And as if we didn't love TikTok enough already, I get trapped into TikTok like an hour a night. So it really is great to know as a creator in the true crime space that when I am, you know, on that true crime TikTok and I see these families and stuff talking about their experiences, it's nice to know that it it can be a positive thing. That's in, in, in that humanizing idea. I love that. Thank you for sharing that and your experience and all of your answers and information today. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank, thank you guys so much for having me. And hopefully we can collaborate again and talk about developments and maybe case closure or something like that. <laughs> we would love that. When you get your resolution, because I'm going to carry that with me, by the way, it's not closure, it's resolution. Thank you again. And we would absolutely love to have you back on. We'll keep in touch. Make sure you follow us on all of our socials at the Murder Diaries pod. And until then, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.